Hello, and welcome to the scientist.com webinar, high resolution mapping of genome wide protein DNA binding using using cut and run and cut and tag presented in collaboration with antibodiesonline.com. Just a few reminders before we begin the presentation. This webinar is being recorded and will be made available to all registrants and attendees within 48 hours after the event. If you have any questions during the presentation, please ask them by using the Q&A function, which you should see at the bottom of your Zoom window with the large letters Q&A. Our panelists will answer submitted questions at the end of the presentation. Today, we are going to have a brief introduction followed by a presentation into cut and run and cut and tag, as well as some variations, as well as their differences to alternative methods such as ChIP-seq and ATAC-seq by Stefan Pellens of antibodiesonline.com. Finally, we will have a question and answer section. Before diving into today's presentation, I'd like to introduce myself as well as our speaker. My name is Romila Mukherjee and I am the Senior Director of Research Concierge and Marketplace Content here at scientist.com. Essentially, when a user or researcher submits a request for services on the platform, I look over the request to make sure it has all of the relevant or necessary technical details and send out the request to our supplier network. Our speaker today is Stefan Pellens, who's a PhD in Product Manager at antibodiesonline.com. Dr. Pellens holds a PhD in genetics obtained from Université Paris. During his PhD work carried out at the Institut Pasteur of, in Paris, he studied the evolution of homing endonucleases and their involvement in the propagation of mobile genetic elements in the mitochondria of different yeast species. His postdoc work at the University of Washington in Seattle focused on the application of homing endonucleases, talons, and CRISPR-Cas9 for genome engineering in cultured human cells. At antibodiesonline.com, Dr. Pellens is responsible for the customer validation program and the cut and run and cut and tack product lines. I will now briefly introduce scientist.com and our partnership with Antibodies Online before Stefan begins the content of his presentation. Scientist.com is an online marketplace for R&D outsourcing, which means we connect researchers from any organization with a global list of suppliers offering custom R&D services. Those services cover a wide range throughout the drug development life cycle, and you can see some examples at the bottom of the slide. To support researchers at every step of their research pipelines, scientists.com have partnered with Antibodies Online for our Antibody and Proteins Products Hub. Here, researchers can find, compare, and purchase off-the-shelf reagents specific to their study. In light of the COVID-19 pandemic unfolding over the course of the last year, Antibodies Online is constantly extending their offerings of product re products relevant for COVID-19 research. Within one month after the pandemic had been declared, Antibodies Online offered 600 SARS-CoV-2 related antibodies, proteins, and kits, which have been delivered by now to 470 labs worldwide. To help scientists keep pace with COVID-19, Antibodies Online launched the world's first product-centric SARS-CoV-2 mutations tracker. Since the extent at which mutations from different lineages can impact the efficacy of vaccines and diagnostics, it is still a major concern in the development of therapies. So this site serves as a hub to keep track of significant SARS-CoV-2 variants and their characteristic mutations and related products. So now I will hand it over to Stefan to introduce Cut and Run and Cut and Tag. Yeah, I thank you very much Romy, for your kind introduction. Um, on the following slides, I'll be talking about two exciting methods for high-resolution mapping of genome-wide protein DNA binding, termed cut and run, cut and tag. Both methods were originally conceived in uh, Stephen Hennikoff's lab at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center in Seattle, Washington. And uh, both are focused on localizing epigenetic marks and binding sites of regulators, such as transcription factors and repressors. Um, besides the application in epigenetics, uh, cut and run and cut and tag um, have the potential of replacing chip seek in many applications that it's being in today, uh, used in today. So in order to be able to appreciate the full power of both methods um, and the advantages in particular compared to chip seek, um, let's talk, uh, let's take a step back and uh, start by having a closer look at chip seek. <clears throat> 
So ChIP-seq is a method that combines chromatin immunoprecipitation and the capabilities of high throughput next generation sequencing. It has been used for the better part of the last 10 to 15 years, um, and it relies on the chromatin precipitation using antibodies that has been used for um, at least another 10 years prior to that. Chromatin immunoprecipitation has been fine-tuned over the years, um, but this mainly accounts to um, the readout. So first, um, it has been improved by using microarrays with chip-on-chip, uh, and then later on um, by um, 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 employing ChIP-seq with next generation sequencing. However, the entire upstream part, so meaning the, the wet lab part involving chromatin immune precipitation itself has largely stayed the same over the time. So in short, what happens is um, one takes a protein of interest indicated here on this slide in the upper left by the dark green shape attached to the DNA string in the nucleus. This protein is fixed in place so that during the subsequent steps, it remains attached to the DNA that it is usually bound to. Then the entire cell is lysed and chromatin is fragmented in one step. So typically this is achieved by enzymatic digestion or by sonication. The important thing to note here is that this process is very unspecific. So um, accordingly, one ends up with a mix of DNA fragments shown here in the upper right which are not necessarily related to the protein of interest. So those are shown here in black, the unspecific ones. In addition to those DNA fragments that your protein of interest binds to actually, which are indicated here in green. To this protein of interest, one then binds an antibody shown in blue, which is used to enrich for the targets of interest. So the bound DNA is pulled out of the mix with the antibody and the protein of interest that the antibody is specific for. At this point now, I'd really like to stress that this is by no means um, a purification, but instead it's a target enrichment. So the green DNA fragments of interest are enriched relative to the background, but there is always a substantial carryover of these black undesired sequences as well which is um, uh, downstream also reflected in the sequencing reads. So at this stage, then the proteins and antibodies are digested off the DNA. The DNA is prepared either by column precipitate, precipitation or whichever other method uh, one chooses. And um, what one ends up with um, is, um, yeah, is this mix of isolated uh, DNA fragments of various lengths. Um, so both the, the black ones that you're not interested in, as well as the green ones that you are interested in. Um, for sequencing, these DNA fragments are then converted into a DNA sequencing library using a ligation-mediated um, PCR. So sequencing adapters are attached at both ends. The library is amplified and sequenced. Reads are mapped and binding sites of your protein of interest are revealed um, subsequently through p-calling. Because of the large amount of undesi undesired DNA, as I've stressed several times now, that has been carried over, um, one needs a substantial number of reads, typically in the order of magnitude of tens of millions of reads, to get data that's sufficiently reliable to draw any conclusions regarding the binding sites of your protein of interest. So in summary, ChIP-seq is a well-established technique with its strengths, but definitely also its shortcomings, as I hope to have made clear by now. So as a uh, change slide, please, thank you. Um, as an alternative technique, which puts away with some of those shortcomings, um, CHIC was developed uh, in the early 2000s in Ulrich Lemley's lab at the University of Geneva. Um, so CHIC stands for chromatin, um, chromatin immunocleavage. And uh, uh, DNA fragmentation is achieved in a more targeted manner than the shotgun approach that was uh, when applying gypsum. A uh, very important thing to notice here is that the cells remain intact, so it's an in situ method. As before with ChIP-seq, the protein of interest is fixed in place on its target DNA. However, you do not proceed to cell lysis. Instead, the cells are exposed to a mild detergent, typically digitonin, which renders the cells sufficiently permeable for antibodies against the protein of interest to enter. Um, the antibodies then, shown here in blue, passes the plasma membrane and the nuclear envelope to bind the protein of interest. Uh, here, shown, here shown in yellow is also an additional secondary antibody. Um, the, the, pro, the protein A moiety of the, this is important for the protein A moiety of the uh, protein A MNAs 
fusion protein that is being used subsequently to bind um, to uh, uh, to bind to uh, to have sorry to have a sufficiently high number of FC fragments at, at its disposition to bind to. Um, the MNAs uh, this uh, MNAs itself, once it is uh, localized close to its intended cleavage site, does not have a specificity uh, specificity for a particular DNA sequence, and so it is not expected to introduce any significant sequence bias into the into the generated uh, library. Uh, an additional benefit of the MNAs here for the targeted uh, fragmentation of DNA is its small size. So therefore, the, the MNAs cleavage, uh, shown here in the middle on the left, leaves an accurate footprint of the protein of interest on its uh, target DNA. The resulting complex, consisting then of the DNA fragment itself, the bound protein of interest, the antibodies bound to the proteins, and also the protein A MNAs, can then diffuse out of the nucleus um, and out of the cells, here shown in the lower left, and um, can then be recovered from, from the supernatant. Since the cells remain intact, they kind of act as a, as a sieve as well, reducing the amount of high molecular DNA present outside the cells post cleavage. As before for chip seek, the proteins are digested and one ends up with a DNA fraction that contains mainly the sequence of interest with a consistent size reflecting the protein binding site. So the main shortcoming now chick compared to chip seek is that um, the readout is by southern blot, so which is which with which is a method that is by no means amenable to a high throughput mapping on a genomic scale. So enter cut and run. Cut and run now combines the underlying idea of chick of targeted fragmentation of genomic DNA in situ with high throughput sequencing capabilities of chip seek. Similar to chick, cells remain intact throughout the entire protocol. However, there's an additional step prior to cell perme permeabilization. Cells are here immobilized on the solid phase, which facilitates cell retention throughout the protocol, which involves various um, buffer exchange and washing steps. Typically, and that is, uh, and that as well as in the original protocol described by Stephen Hennikov in 2017, the cells are immobilized on magnetic beads coated with concannabinoid A shown in the top row in the middle. Concannabinoid A is a lectin that interacts unspecifically with the glycoproteins on the cell surface, thus making it possible to easily pull the cells out of solution. Subsequently, cells are permeabilized using digitonin, as for chick, followed by incubation with an antibody specific for the protein of interest and the protein A MNase fusion protein. The protein A binds very well to rabbit antibodies in general and also to most mouse, mouse antibody isotopes. However, it's, um, it's binding to uh, particularly murine IgG1 subclass antibodies is comparatively weak. So in case you're working with a mouse IgG1 monoclonal antibody against your protein of interest, um, uh, this, is not, this is not ideal. So one option to circ uh, circumvent this issue is, for example, the use of uh, rabbit anti-mouse secondary antibody to assure efficient binding of um, the PA MNAs. Um, or alternatively, um, a second solution for the issue is described in the improved cut and run protocol, which was also published by the Hennikoff lab and that in 2019. So in this case, an MNAs fusion protein containing both protein A and protein G moieties um, enable the use of a wider range of primary antibodies covering virtually any available antibody that you, could, that you could be working with. Accordingly, here depicted are only a primary antibody without a secondary and the, uh, and the advanced protein A and protein G containing MNAs uh, fusion protein, here in the gray in the middle. So once the MNA is, MNAs is bound by the antibody close to the intended DNA cleavage site, it is activated by the addition of divalent metal cations, typically calcium. The MNAs cleaves the DNA, the digestion product is released, diffuses out of the cells, and can then be prepared. Compared to chip seek, the amount of contaminating DNA is very small, and the DNA fragment size is very homogeneous. The rest is very similar to, chip seek, to the chip seek protocol, so um, the sequencing primers are attached by ligation, DNA fragments are then amplified by PCR, and the, uh, the amplified library is sequenced. Sequencing reads are then mapped and binding sites identified by p-calling, as before for chips. Uh, next slide, please. So then for, um, for cut and tag, um, cleavage under target followed by tagmentation. 
Um, this represents a variation of the, of the cut and run method in which the DNA fragmentation is achieved by a hyperactive transposase. This method was first described also by Nehenikov lab in a publication um, that came out in 2019. The initial steps of the protocol are very similar to those in cut and run. So the intact cells are immobilized again on magnetic CONA beads, permeabilized using a buffer containing typically digitonin, and a primary antibody that binds to the protein of interest um, attached to its target DNA, shown here all in the top row. Generally, a, uh, a secondary antibody is used in cut and tag, regardless of the primary antibody's isotype, shown here in the middle on the right. So the purpose of the secondary antibody is to increase the number of FC fragments in the vicinity of the protein of interest's binding site. Um, this depiction here of the situation is inaccurate in the sense that it suggests binding of exactly one secondary antibody to one primary and one transposome here in gray to each secondary. However, in reality, second, uh, several secondaries will, uh, will bind to each primary antibody and there will also be more than, more than one transposome localized by the protein M or AT close to the protein binding site. Consequently, the use of a secondary antibody leads to an amplification of the signal just by increasing the relative amount of uh, FC fragments um, close to the binding site. Um, this amplification appears to be necessary to subsequently detect the cut and tag fragment peaks. The advantage of using a transposase instead of the nuclease is the omission of the attachment of sequencing primers um, by the means of ligation. Sequencing primers are directly part of the transposome itself, and they are attached during the tegmentation reaction, shown here in the middle on the left. Once the tegmented DNA has been cle um, cleaned, uh, cleaned up, the library can be right away PCR amplified without an additional ligation step, and mapping of the sequencing reads and p-calling are similar to cut and run. Um, so another method very popular in epigenetics research that also relies on segmentation of genomic DNA by, um, by hyperactive transposase is ATEC-seq, or um, yeah, an acronym uh, which, uh, whose meaning is, uh, is indicated here. Um, I just want to mention this method shortly to illustrate the difference between ATEC-seq and cut and tag. So unlike cut and tag, ATEC-seq does not target specific sequences based on attachment of specific proteins. Instead, open chromatin is segmented depending on its accessibility. Hence, the focus of cut and tag and ATEC seq is very different, um, although there exists by now also variation of cut and tag that, uh, that targets um, specifically, uh, well, or in a more general manner, um, accessible chromatin. So um, both cut and run and cut and tag are very different from chip seq, not only when it comes to the protocol, but also in terms of the data that's being produced. So the absolute amount of DNA is considerably lower than in ChIP-seq because of the, uh, the targeted chromatin, chromatin fragmentation in cut and run and cut and tag as opposed to ChIP-seq. Consequently, the overall signal strength, that means the total number of sequence read is lower. However, since the relative amount of, um, relevant, of relevant DNA sequences is also higher, the signal to noise ratio in cut and run and cut and tag is considerably higher than in a typical chip seq data set. Therefore, it's possible to get meaningful data from a, uh, from a few million sequencing reads from cut and run and cut and tag, as opposed to tens of million reads from chip seq, as I had mentioned before. So let's quickly compare a few other factors side by side for chip seq, chick, cut and run, and, uh, and, cut, um, and cut and tag. Uh, because of the high background signal, one needs to start for chip seq with a substantial amount of material. That's a big difference compared to cut and run and cut and take. One can work with hundreds of thousands of cells down to, a hundred, uh, to hundreds of cells for cut and run. There are even protocols for ultra low cell number, numbers down to single cell levels using, uh, using barcoding strategies. For chip seq, one typically works with fixed proteins, although there are variations such as native chip where you, where you, um, where you don't. Um, and uh, in context with Chica, I had mentioned earlier cell fixation also. Um, the original publication does actually describe work with both fixed and non-fixed cells, so both work. Cut and run and cut and take usually depart from non-fixed cells uh, to stress the in situ aspect, but that being said, depending on target, for example, for transiently interacting proteins, uh, light fix fixation has also been um, used extensively. So next, um, um, cell, uh, cell isotopes are whole cells as starting materials. 
ChIP-seq always involves cell lysis, as I had mentioned before. Uh, not only is the step important to make chromatin accessible, but also to fragment the chromatin itself. CHIC is an in situ method that works either with whole cells or isolated nuclei, and the same goes for cut and run and cut and tag. Before I only mentioned um, whole cells, but there are protocols as well to work with nuclei. This is, for example, interesting if you work in yeast or plant cells where cells are surrounded by a cell wall. Besides some variations of cut and run and cut and tag, depart from isolate, isolated nuclei, uh, for example, to emit digitonin in the buffer. Next, um, DNA fragment size distribution. Fragment size, uh, size distribution in chip seek typically um, is rather um, heterogeneous, and it's difficult to assure similar size distribution across different chip seek experiments, which um, means as well reproducibility is, is more difficult in this case to achieve. So for chick, chromatin fragments are equally sized, basically defined by the footprint covered by the protein. And accordingly, the same is true also for cut and run, since it relies on the same enzyme. Uh, the transposase in cut and tag also assures a homogeneous distribu uh, distribution of pigmentation product sizes. It does, however, not produce an equally sharp footprint as does the, the MNAs in chick and cut and run. As mentioned a moment ago, the background signal in ChIP-seq is very high, despite um, the, tar um, the target enrichment, because of the unspecific nature of the chromatin fragmentation. This, does co um, this costs a considerable number of sequencing reads, and with this also time and money. So this is definitely an aspect um, when comparing ChIP-seq and cut and run as well. The background in CHIC uh, is substantially lower, and the same goes for uh, cut and run and cut and tag. Again, the overall signal that you get is much lower as well for cut and run and cut and tag, but since the dynamic range is substantially higher, um, one can get away with that. Readout for chip seek as well as for cut and run and cut and tag is next generation sequencing. So, on a, so you're working on a whole genome level and for chick it is southern blot, which is probably the main reason why the method was never widely adopted. Library amplification for chip seek and cut and run then is achieved by ligation mediated PCR, as I had mentioned before. Uh, and for cut and tag, it is P uh, PCR because the desired sequencing adapters are already attached during the tegmentation reaction. Um, an aspect I had not mentioned before is quantitation. Quantitation is an important factor to allow comparison of samples across different experiments as well as within one experiment. It is comparatively difficult to achieve in chip seek. In cut and run, on the other hand, it can be done using heterogeneous um, spike in DNA as an internal standard. Uh, or um, later on in the improved cut and run protocol that I had mentioned earlier, that was um, published in 2019, quantification relies on the uh, on DNA that is carried over from um, with the PAG MNAs being produced in E. coli. So as long as the same batch and the same amount of the protein A, protein G, MNAs is being used, data can be normalized across experiments. So at Antibodies Online, we have put together a couple of cut and run product sets that are focused around cut and run. We do not offer specific cut and tag product sets at this point, uh, but we are working on those. The cut and run sets contain positive and negative control antibodies. The positive control antibody is a recombinant rabbit antibody against trimethylated lysine 27 of histone 3, um, which is an abundant epigenetic marker. Alternatively, we also have a polyclonal and a rabbit antibody against trimethylated lysine 4 of histone 3. Some of the product sets that we offer contain a secondary antibody for work with uh, mouse IgG1 monoclonal antibodies in conjunction with a protein A MNAs A, meaning that um, the older version of the MNAs that does not contain the, the protein G moiety. We also offer some sets that include anti flag antibodies for use with recombinant proteins containing such a tag. All of the sets contain an unspecific guinea pig uh, anti rabbit secondary antibody as negative control. This control is important in cut and run to establish a baseline to compare sequencing um, reads, um, uh, to compare sequencing reads and peaks um, across different, uh, different experiments. The idea here is that the chromatin is covered by this unspecific antibody evenly in a random fashion, just based on the, the attraction of the antibody uh, on, the, on the attraction of the antibody based on the charge to DNA. 
As such, the MNase will also bind evenly across the genome because it binds to the antibody and thus introduce DNA breaks in, a, in an, even, uh, in an even, evenly distributed. If the MNase could move freely without being immobilized by the antibody, it would start chewing away DNA wherever it, uh, it's accessible. Each of these, uh, these sets with, uh, um, with the pro moniker here contain magnetic silica be uh, beads based on um, uh, their, um, their, for the immobilization. So absent from the uh, next slide, please. Absent from these product sets um, is the, the PAG MNA. So the MNA is containing the protein A and protein G moieties. Um, this essential enzyme, com uh, which is the essential enzyme component for cut and run. We are offering the um, Kutana PAG MNAs for chick and cut and run assays from EpiCypher, which um, is the only commercial source for this enzyme at this point. It's available in quantities for 50 or 250 reactions, depending on your needs. And uh, yeah, the MNAs uh, here is fused to both protein A and protein G. So you're free to choose any antibody to work with against the, your protein of interest. So in addition, we are, uh, we are also offering agarose-based magnetic on A beads as an alternative to the established silica-based beads. So the, the original beads are based on a super paramagnetic silica core to which the concannabinoid A lectin is, uh, is bound by a silenized surface. So in our experience, uh, in our experience as well as uh, according to the feedback of some customers, these beads can be difficult to handle throughout the different wash and resuspension steps because they have a tendency to stick to plastic wear, um, as shown here in the on the picture in the in the in the lower left in the lower left all the way on the left. Um, therefore, we are now offering um, agarose based con A beads with a ferromagnetic core with a permanent weak magnetic moment. Um, so their surface is hydrophilic due to the fact that there are no residual charges left. Uh, as a consequence, this prevents them from sticking to plastic wear. As you can see, um, again, in the picture on the lower left on the tubes in the middle, um, where we have um, used different amounts of these. Several customers have already tested uh, these beads and provided it with feedback uh, regarding their performance in comparison to the silica beads. These heat maps here on the right uh, were provided by uh, Sarah Hainer from the University of Pittsburgh, who tested 10 microliter of these agarose beads on uh, cut and run in cut and run on uh, 100,000 um, urine acid at starting materials. She tested them actually alongside the magnetic silica bead uh, based on A beads and found them to to perform comparably in uh, uh, but uh, handling uh, was improved with uh, with the agarose beads. Um, next slide, please, um, which shows uh, data from a different customer from the Max Planck Institute of Immunology and Epigenetics in Freiburg here in Germany, um, which also compared, um, which also used 10 microliter of the agarose beads um, shown here in this IGB blot in the, in the bottom on the second lane from the bottom, in comparison to the silica beads, which are, um, which are in the lane above that, um, so uh, side by side, she used uh, 5,000 unfixed mouse cells in uh, cut and run using um, H3K4 ME3 antibody. Um, an, a reference H3K4 ME3 track is also shown here in the IGB plot in the second lane from the top um, to have an idea where to look for, uh, where to look for peaks. So in, in her case, um, uh, she found that the agarose beads um, gave a clearer result with, um, with less backgrounds. Um, so we are offering um, to all our customers the possibility to test uh, these beads as well as any antibodies risk-free on their samples and cut and run and cut and tag within the scope of our customer validation program. So we are offering a full refund in return for validation report, regardless of the outcome of the validation experiment. This is also the advantage of uh, other cut and run, uh, um, to the advantage of other cut and run and cut and tag users because the actual user data and the po and possibly adapted protocols from these users become available early on without the need to wait for um, for formal publication of these. Uh, if you're interested in part participating in in this uh, customer validation program, please um, please let me know. Um, there will be a, an email address uh, to this and um, displayed at the, uh, towards the end of the talk. Um, shown here is another example for such a customer validation, uh, which in this case um, 
uh, was for our rabbit polyclonal SOX2 antibody that has been validated by, um, uh, by Claudio Cantu at uh, Linköping University. So his lab is actually validating at the moment numerous additional antibodies for, for cut and run. And um, as soon as these, this data comes into we'll publish this on our site as well. Uh, yeah. So until now, we have customer validation reports for cut and run and cut and tag for uh, these products shown here in the table on top. Um, I have already mentioned two validation reports for the agarose based magnetic on A-beads um, to immobilize cells for cut and run and cut and tag. We have also a customer validation report for, um, for the cut and run um, pro set containing the silica beads, the guinea pig negative control antibody, as well as the HVK27 ME3 uh, positive control antibody. Besides, we have received validation reports for the five antibodies here listed on top. And several validations are ongoing for antibodies against various histone modifications and regulators, um, as shown here on the bottom. So um, lastly, we are constantly extending our list of antibodies suitable for cut and run and or cut and take based on, on our own data, as well as the data that we um, re um, receive from the respective suppliers. The, um, the, so this, um, you can access this list under this link. Um, and uh, yeah, as I said, it's, we, we, are con we are constantly extending this list. Um, that was, yeah, in short, that was what I had to say about these two methods. Um, and I thank you very much for your interest um, and your attention. And I'd be very happy to answer any questions you might have. Great, thank you, Stefan. That was a very informative presentation and I see that the audience actually does have some questions. So the first question that's come through is, do you have um, an anti-HA tag cut and run kits available? Um, no, uh, we do not. Um, so this, uh, our choice for the flag tag was that, um, so the, or um, the original cut and run publications from the Hennikov lab used, uh, used flag tags. Um, which I think is kind of a cultural thing because I have the impression that flag tags are very popular, um, especially for American customers. Um, we would definitely be interested in extending the list of, um, of tag antibodies. So if you're interested, um, please shoot me an email and I see which options we have. And um, as I had just said, we'd be happy as well uh, to, uh, to provide a refund uh, if you are interested in testing these in, uh, in exchange for, for validation data. Great. And then another uh, question that came through is for tissue samples, do you suggest whole cells or nuclei? As it might be difficult to separate cell well from the tissues. Um, yeah, I have trouble to give, it, uh, to give um, a general answer here because um, depending on the tissue actually, um, per, um, cut and run works very well um, as well as cut and take works very well from tissue. Um, so I know, for, um, so for example, I know that for some drosophila tissues, so where you have very small amounts of tissue, um, cut and run works on the whole tissue actually. So you don't even have to separate, uh, you don't even have to, to isolate cells. Um, if you have larger tissues, um, you can um, try either dissociation of the tissues uh, using trituration, using a pipette, um, or as well an enzymatic um, dissociation, like for example, um, acutase. Um, I think it gets a little bit more difficult as soon as you go to something like plant or yeast material, because in this case, you also have to deal with a cell wall, which you will have to digest off first. So then you actually end up with, um, uh, with nuclei. That being said, I know that, uh, that a lot of people by now work with, um, with nuclei. So um, the, the Hennikov lab actually has, um, has published a couple of protocols working with, um, with nuclei. And one of the big advantages here is that, um, that you, you can get away without using digitonin, which is a little bit temperamental because um, it's, it's not produced uh, synthetically. So the batch to batch variations in its efficiency can be quite, um, quite large. Um, plus it's rather expensive as well. Um, and um, there's also a protocol available where you actually do not switch between different tubes anymore. And that one is based on, on nuclei as well. So um, without knowing more about the, uh, the experimental setting, I cannot recommend one or the other. So both are possible, both have advantages and disadvantages. That would, my, would be my answer here. Yeah. 
Great. And then um, another question that came through, how to confirm cut and run results? So like what can be a good control for cut and run input pre-immune IgG or unrelated IgG? It's kind of two questions in one. Yes. Um, so, um, I mean, uh, um, what, what I had shown here in a couple of tracks that I had earlier already, I mean, it's uh, you're in a very, in a very uh, comfortable position if you can already um, rely on existing data sets that you can uh, that you can compare your data sets with. Um, now the um, for the so the so the unrelated IgG I assume that re that refers to to negative control. So one possibility with a negative control that, uh, that I had mentioned is the yeah is is an unrelated IgG um, antibody that which is the one that we include in our sets which uh, which is um, from uh, from guinea pig. It's a secondary. Um, establish kind of a baseline. Um, this was uh, this was described like this also in the original cut and run publications. But I know as well that many customers actually do prefer not to use this uh, uh, this control and instead they norm uh, normalize based on the total uh, the total read number. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if this is sufficient as an as an answer. If this is uh, if this is useful to. Uh, Uh, Can you actually do a qPCR to confirm the results, the cut and run results? Uh, yes, this also is uh, this also is something that uh, that many customers do, especially those that are uh, that are used to um, to chip seek. So they have um, established already qPCR protocol um, qPCR as a as a QC in the, in their protocol. So so it um, it is it is possible. The problem might be here that uh, the total. Um, the, um, to do this before amplification of the library, just because the overall signal is uh, is rather low, but uh, yes, it's definitely an option. Great, and then we looks like we also got sort of a product question. So, um, can one get the pro set with Agros Con A beads, or or it comes with the silica ones by default, and you have to purchase the Agros Con A beads separately? Yeah. So, um, so the the idea with the um, with uh, the process uh, with the sets was that um, uh, we put them originally together because we we put products in there that we considered useful to get started with cut and run and um, by putting them together in a uh, in a set we could offer them at, an, at a lower price point. Um, however, the the composition of these sets is not really set in stone, so um, we are very happy to uh, to give the to give the agaros uh, beads instead. So um, if um, if if you wish to if you want to do that, um, please just shoot us an email. Uh, you can refer as well to my name since it's going to land on my desk anyway, and uh, we go from there. So we add, so we don't have the sets at the moment like this, but we can definitely adapt. And you do not have to buy both um, beads if you're not interested in getting both. Great. And then, um, can cut and run be performed on FFPE or solid tumor tissues? Um, the first. Um, the first, uh, I'm actually not, I'm not comfortable to answer with the second one because I honestly don't know. Um, I know that the first, um, uh, on FFP tissues, it has, it has been done. Um, I'm just thinking, I, um, uh, be, yeah, sorry, because I, I do not, I do not remember now the, the, uh, the publication. I just, saw, I, I just saw this recently. I, I would have to look this up to give a more specific answer to this. Right. Um, um, again, uh, if um, please feel free to send me an email and I will answer to the email then. Mm -hmm. And then um, we also we got um, a request a question that came in. Hello from Germany that said, uh, thank you very much for the nice insight on cut and run and cut and tag. And they were asking um, about the experience with different cell types as well. So kind of a follow-up, but currently mm -hmm. struggling to do it on cardiomyocytes, which are big cells with lots of uh, cytoplasm compared to small, mostly nuclei cells. Any suggestions or recommendations for working with larger cells? Um, and so, you know, it might just be that you can use only on nuclei, which might already be kind of a good hint, but any yeah. suggestions for these larger yeah, cells? So yeah, actually, that that's probably the that that's that would probably be my recommendation because I mean, as soon as you have a lot of cytoplasm, um, in addition to the relatively small nucleus, you will end up having a lot of contaminations uh, um, that you will that you will end up seeing afterwards. 
you will end up seeing you might end up seeing this in your in your um, uh, in your reads um, and um, in case that the cell, uh, that that cells break during the um, purification I don't know as well if this is something that might influence the PCR later on as well so yeah probably I would I would go for um, working with uh, the isolated nuclei okay and then you may have mentioned this um, earlier but what would be a nice um, example for an input sample? Um, so I would, I mean, it's, uh, it, it depends again on the, on the experiment. If, I mean, in an ideal experiment, you will um, expose yourselves to, um, to, to a substance that triggers a particular um, cellular reaction. So in this case, it would be easy. You just take the untreated cells um now if uh, yeah other than that if you want to have a reference um i would choose as a yeah i would i would probably then um, make a combination of negative controls and unspecific antibody which uh, kind of to establish a baseline as well as uh, as a very abundant target um to kind of uh, to kind of get an idea of a of a higher signal um, to uh, to compare your your data to them, so yeah, I would yeah I would combine I would combine these two. Great, and then um, shifting gears a little bit, can you speak a bit more about the customer validation program regarding antibodies, and does it cost anything? Let's follow up to that. Ah, okay. Um, so the customer validation program is uh, is set up in a way that um, we ask the cust um, uh, that we ask the customer to uh, provide us a little bit of background uh, regarding uh, regarding the experiments, um, in particular the um, the controls that, uh, that they're foreseeing, um, and um, generally customers um, when they are when they are um, when they participate in the customer validation program for the first time, we ask them to to um, to buy the products. Um, and afterwards, we refund them. Um, people that repeatedly participate in the customer validation program generally, so once they know us and we know them, um, we provide them the antibodies uh, um, for free. For the, so um, for the yeah, as I said, so for the first time, generally we asked um, customers to buy them. Afterwards, they get them for free. Um, as for the report. Um, uh, we can um, actually I think there was one backup slide which shows one of these reports. Um, just uh, to have an idea what this uh, what this looks like. Um, generally, what I do is I provide um, I provide a template for these reports that are then afterwards fit sp uh, with specific for the for respective uh, respective validation um, experiment. Um, and um, before uh, before um, publishing anything, I run this always um, again by the uh, by the respective validators so that they can cross check if everything is correct if they're Results are um, are represented in the correct way, and only once the customer then gives us the get go, um, uh, then I then I make these publicly available. Great, and then it looks like we actually got one um, last question for your um, for the cut and run and cut and tag. How many replicates do you suggest for one sample? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I think this depends a little bit on uh, on how much um, sample material you have you, uh, you have at your disposition. Um, I would take a minimum of two because that will allow you afterwards to see if you have um, uh, if they relate to each other. Um, so because I mean across two experiments, you should you should see you should see similar results. Um, if you have if you have enough material, um, I would probably go with uh, with uh, with triplicates already because um, in um, unlike for chip seek. Um, sequencing costs are not so much of an issue with cut and run and cut and tag. So um, yeah, so the number of replicates, in my opinion, is mainly dictated by how much uh, starting material you have at your disposition. And uh, um, more is better than fewer. Excellent. Yeah. 
Um, okay, so that looks like that completes our questions for today. So we're going to go ahead and wrap up. Thank you so much to Dr. Pelens for presenting and antibodiesonline.com for collaborating on this event. If you have any additional questions or you would like to get in touch with us, our information is available on this slide. This webinar was also recorded and will be available for later listening. Thank you so much for joining scientist.com and we look forward to seeing you at the next webinar.